Last year, I had the privilege to spend some time with a family of gorillas in the natural habitats in the mountains of Rwanda. It was quite fascinating to watch them interact, the social interaction, the way they have conversation with their own special language. And they didn't pay much attention to my presence there, as you can see. <laughs> But this reminded me of a very special gorilla called Coco. Coco was able to communicate with human beings using sign language. In fact, she could speak more than 1,000 signs and understood over 2,000 words in spoken English over her 46 years, which is quite remarkable. Now, of course, who would think that um, a gorilla could have a conversation? Before Coco, many people would not imagine this is even possible. But this also brings up the question, if we stretch our imagination, how much can we have a conversation with computers? How much can we use artificial intelligence to have real conversation? Unlike Coco, we need to use artificial intelligence for computers to be able to have a conversation. Now, we do have some progress in this direction. In fact, artificial intelligence has progressed so much in recent years that in many cases we're just using it without paying much attention. Think about our all-powerful mobile that we can take pictures practically unlimited number of pictures of high quality. Suppose we want to search for a picture out of the uh, many pictures we have in our albums. In fact, we don't need to browse through our uh, endless albums. We can just ask our phones to get us pictures about, say, birds and sunset, and often get just the right result. Without ever labeling those pictures or annotating them, the AI can just find and identify pictures of birds in the sunset. And the reason why this is possible is due to advancements in machine learning, notably technology called deep neural networks. This technology was in, is inspired in part by how we think many of the brain functions work. So an image that we'd like to understand what's there can feed in into, as input into a deep neural network. And then in a simplified explanation, uh, it excites various neurons layer by layer until at the end we're getting a classification of whether this is likely a cat or a dog or a bird in the sunset. And the way in which we're building these computational neural networks is actually by training them on various images of cats and dogs, much in the same way that we are learning to identify a new object. So this ability of having machine learning to identify images is quite important. In fact, it has many applications, many situations where it can be life-changing much beyond identifying photos in our photo albums, which is a lot of fun. Think about all the health applications. Think about identifying conditions on medical images. Take, for example, a condition called diabetic retinopathy. This is a condition where people with diabetics can suffer their loss of their vision up to blindness if not treated. Now, it can be diagnosed uh, quite, uh, it's pretty common to diagnose it now by experts, by eye doctors who are looking at images of the retina and being able to identify this as diabetic retinopathy and then treat it. The problem is there's a big shortage in experts who could do that, especially in development areas, which puts at risk millions of people with diabetics to lose their eyesight. Fortunately, technology not dissimilar from the one we were using to identify birds in sunset can be used also to identify this condition in a way actually in par with what experts can do today. So today we start seeing various systems that can help out save people's eyesight. In fact, all the patients need to do is to come to take their, a picture of the retinas and then use the AI system to help diagnose the condition and get a treatment for those that otherwise perhaps would be too late for them to see a doctor before losing their eyesight. And there are many more, more applications in health where we can use AI to help out people. And there are many other areas of societal impact. Think about crisis, where we're paying a lot of attention since in crisis situations, information is paramount to help people be safe. Consider floods. Floods is one of the most devastating natural disasters. It impacts millions of people worldwide and, in effect, is responsible for over 6,000 fatalities every year. If you could only have better forecasting of where floods are going to occur, you could help keep people safe. So in an effort led by an Israeli team with global teams, we looked into how to use AI to help out with forecasting of floods. 
So the way we do that is actually taking a lot of data driven into machine learning models, which take information such as the river level, the terrain, historical information, and then generate maps and run simulations, sometimes hundreds of thousands of simulations using a lot of computational power in order to uh, have hydraulic simulations of where the flood may occur in very specific locations, and eventually be able to compute pretty accurately where we may have floods. So in the pilot we did in Patna last year, Patna is an area in India which suffers from many floods, we were able to get forecasting a few hours before the floods up to 90% accuracy. And once having this kind of forecasting, we can disseminate the information to people using public alerts, notifications on their phone, through the authorities, so people in affected areas can take action, can minimize damage, and importantly, be safe. And this is one example where using AI can actually help out on a very significant problem that people are facing. There are many other such situations that we anticipate AI to be helpful. But I'd like to go back to how AI is impacting our own life on a daily basis. And one of the areas that I think is most impactful is conversational AI, is how AI is interacting, how we are interacting with technology, in fact. So many of us gl grew up glued to the imaginative, magical technology of Star Trek, with Captain Kirk talking to a computer. And Alan Turing, founder of computer science, already in 1950, asked the question, could we see eventually people being able to talk with computers much in the same way that they are talking with each other, famously known as the Turing test? Now, just think about what it means if you could have such conversations going on. Because in natural conversation, we can express our ideas, our thoughts, ask questions, do it in a natural way without actually having any friction. Think about how we could interact with technology in a much more natural way for those who find it difficult to interact with technology. So we do have some progress on that, of course. With voice technology, in fact, um, there are many advancements where we don't even pay attention as it goes with technology. Once it's advanced enough, we're using it a little bit, we actually stop paying attention to that. Many people around the world were searching information, they just ask their phone. You can just ask your phone to get pictures of birds in sunset, or use your digital system to set up an alarm or many other tasks. So we start seeing some of these technologies. But can we do more? Can we have computers doing conversations on our behalf? <clears throat> it turns out that in many cases, in order to get things done, we still need to pick up the phone, even today. In fact, 60% of businesses in the US that have online, that are relying on booking for their services, do not have their booking sex, uh, set up, online booking set up, even today with the internet era. So the only way if you want to really book a service is to pick up the phone and talk to them, which is time consuming, sometimes annoying, sometimes impossible for some of the time for some of us, and for all the time for some of us. Could we use AI to do such conversations on our behalf? So we do have some progress in this direction as well. Let me show an example where we can have a Google Assistant system making a phone call on a user's behalf to book a reservation in a restaurant. And the conversation is with the host in the restaurant in a pretty natural way. Let's take a look. Hey, Google. Book a table for two at El Cocotero on Tuesday at 7. All right. Just in case that's not available, can I try between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m.? Sure. All right, I'll call to book under your name and phone number, and I'll update you in the next 15 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect, thanks. El Cocotero, how may I help you? Hi, I'm the Google Assistant, calling to make a reservation for a client. Um, this automated call will be recorded. Can I book a table for Tuesday the 12th? Okay, cool. And how big is the party? It's for two people. Great. And when did you say they want to come in? Um, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, let me check. Mm-hmm. I don't have 7, but we can do 8. Yeah, 8 p.m. is fine. Perfect. And can I get their name? The uh, first name is Anna. Okay. We'll see Anna Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. 
So as we can see, a conversation is pretty natural, uh, and um, the duplex technology, which enables this kind of interaction, developed by uh, teams in Israel and worldwide, is actually using a lot of the technologies that were developed over time recently uh, in recent years, including automatic speech recognition, text-to-speech synthesis, language understanding, understanding the interaction of a language, understanding the context. And you might have observed that it manages to navigate through the unexpected turns of a conversation as we do in real life. And this is possible, by the way, because this technology is focusing on a very specific case of restaurant reservations, so it manages to somehow navigate through that with high success probability. And you might have also noticed uh, those um, uh, speech disfluences, those ums and us that are part of a conversation. They not only make the conversation sound more natural, but actually they have an important role in the conversation. For example, they're used to make the conversation more polite, rather than saying, not at five, at four, it's mm, four. Or to acknowledge that I'm waiting to hear more from the other side. So these are ingredients of a conversation, much in the same way that we have words, and intonation, and others. But by having a natural conversation, we can remove friction. We can have things done in a more natural way without interruption. There are many more ways in which we can have conversational AI be part of our life. Let me give you another example. So some time ago, I was having a conversation with my wife, Shavit, about uh, conversational AI. And she pointed out an opportunity to brilliantly solve a very challenging problem that uh, many can relate to. Every time her phone rings, quite often during a meeting, there's a dilemma. It might be a school calling on a sick child. However, if she picks up the phone, then it's likely going to be a spam call, somebody trying to sell on a cruise, get another insurance, or ask a survey about the upcoming elections. What do you do? Could we use conversational AI to help with that? This was her challenge. So fast forward. We have now many people in the US using a feature called Call Screen, which is using conversational AI to address this problem. And the way it works is that when you get a phone number, when you get a call from an unknown number, one can kick off Call Screen, which would use text to speech synthesis to ask the caller for the purpose of their call. And whatever answer they're going to give is going to be transcribed as they speak on the screen, which allows one to choose to ask additional questions or pick up the phone, or decline possibly reporting a spam without actually talking with the caller. So think about it. You may never need to talk to a telemarketing again, ever. <laughs> so one can think about many other situations where conversational AI can be really part of our life. Just think about the, of the opportunities. Think about the possibilities. Now, anybody going to Moscow for the World Cup could experience or on their own or see others communicating with everybody else using Translate. Think about a situation where the technology is so seamless, so ambient, that you can speak with another person in another language. Everybody's speaking with their language. You can just hear it or see it transcribed on a screen. Think about the opportunity for communication with technology, removing barriers, allowing accessibility to those who need other means of voice or screen. Think about all the other possibilities when we have technology which is more ambient. Now, it's very difficult to predict about the future. In fact, the saying goes that prediction is hard, especially about the future. But if you try to reflect on the past, many of the technologies we take today for granted were considered science fiction not that long ago. So if we're trying to predict with implications of having more ambient intelligence and how it can benefit us, and of course, when we develop AI technologies, we need to be very conscious to make a responsible development, to take into account safety and security and transparency and always make it subject to our values. But think about all the opportunities and all the benefits of having conversational AI and other AI technologies as part of our life, solving the big problems, solving the day-to-day -day problems, reducing friction, make it easy for everybody to use technology in a way that is ambient, seamless, just works. So while it's very difficult to predict it, and uh, it's not likely that we're going to see anytime soon a beam up Scotty technology, I think it's quite the case in many 
it's going to be the case that in many cases, uh, if you can dream it, you can build it. Thank you.